The basic beginnings were among the blacks. Soon white people joined the black people, overflowing the house and forcing them to find another place to continue meeting. Here is a picture made in the late 20s of that old building at 312 Azusa Street. Autos had replaced the horses of the 1906 era, and the church name had been changed. Ironically, this Azusa building had once been a stable. It seems that even as Jesus was born in similar surroundings, God again had chosen a humble house. Right here on Azusa Street, we have filmed two precious black saints, Reverend Catlett and Maddie Cummings, who since have gone on to glory. For almost 20 years, these priceless movies were misplaced in the photographer's studio. It seems that God preserved them just for this day. This is an exciting day to be alive, right here in Los Angeles, just a short ways from the city hall. And over there is a hotel, an old one, but this is an experience because this is the urban renewal site, but it's something else. A great movement took place right here on this spot. Dr. Vincent Sinan, one of the foremost authorities who wrote this book, Charismatic Bridges, has something to share with us today. Who and what happened right here at this spot? From 1906, Ralph, until 1909, the Azusa Street Revival took place right on this open lot. It's open now but one of the greatest revivals in church history because the worldwide Pentecostal movement had its beginning here as a worldwide force and services went on day and night for three years in this place and from this place spirit baptized people went all over the world spreading the story of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now I think we should introduce immediately our friends because it's a rare honor to have these people here with us. They were there when it happened and we think of this as the movement that was started without a man. Jesus is the one who brought this movement into existence. Would you introduce these friends? Yes, first this is Miss Maddie Cummings, who was here at the beginning of the Azusa Street meeting as a young girl. And this is the Reverend Lawrence Catley, who is pastor of a Church of God in Christ in uh, Pasadena. In Pasadena, California. He was here at this great revival, and they are the two only known survivors that I know of who were here at that time. Now, were both of you acquainted at that time? Were you children here in the revival? Yes, we were. You yeah. knew each other? What'd you call each other then? Uh, Lawrence. And Maddie. And Maddie. Yes. <laughs> you plead together. Son, yes. son Cadley. Son Cadley. And this, son. Was a, this was a Methodist church. This when, was yes. originally an uh, African Methodist church. And they built a new church on 8th and Town Avenue and rented this to Azusa Mission. And eventually, Azusa bought it. Now you were, uh, wasn't it true that uh, both of you received tremendous healings here at this spot? Yes, I received healing. I was deaf and I, God healed me and now I can hear. How many years uh, ago? Oh, that's been around 70 years ago now. Somebody said healings don't last. Oh, they do. And sometimes I think I hear too much, but thank God for hearing. <laughs> you mean you really were, were deaf? Deaf, yes. I couldn't go to school. You could not go to go school? school, no. And what about you? Well, I had what we called TB in those days, and tuberculosis, and it was a terrible experience. And I heard that uh, there was a place uptown called Azusa Mission where they prayed for people and they got well. And I asked my mother to bring me, and she eventually brought me. And through the laying on of hands and the prayer, God delivered me from that TB. And I have, know I'm delivered because of, not only because of the way I feel, but I have been examined by a lung specialist in World War I, and they said, nothing the matter with you, boy. Get out of here. Would you tell me how old you are? I'm 79 years old. Are last you really? November the 23rd, 1974. Hey, this is quite an exciting day to be alive, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Sign, what would you say this place looked like when the Holy Spirit began to fall? Well. I think these two could tell a lot more than I could because they were here. Well, you researched it, so I thought you might. <laughs> well, it was just a two-block street. Azusa Street is a very short street uh, near the city hall. It was in the downtown area. And Elder William J. Seymour had come from Texas to hold a revival here in a Nazarene church. But he preached a new experience, the baptism with the Holy Spirit accompanied by speaking with other tongues. Mm -hmm and a revival broke out in the Asbury home on Bonnie Bray Street. People received this experience and crowds filled the streets and then they came to find the church building and they found this old abandoned Methodist church building that had been used as a warehouse. 
a storage place and I think a stable at one time too. And they found it, it was empty. It had no stained glass windows, no pews. They just had rough hewn uh, benches. Mm -hmm. But here a worldwide revival began and people came from all over the world to this spot to find out what they had. Could you tell us what the main experience was that attracted the people, Maddie? Well, I think first it was because they came and they began to speak in tongues and people heard them speak in their own language. The Japanese, Chinese, and all the different nationalities, they heard them speak and the gospel was preached to them. You mean they had not learned these languages? Oh, no, they had not learned because the Spirit of God filled them and they really... Uh, knew what the people were talking about, and they too were saved. Now, you saw this and heard this with your own ears. I certainly did. Now, Dr. Simon, was this interracial, all different nationalities? The, the great thing, I believe, from studying the history of it was that people from all races and nations and tribes came here. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles yes. was a melting pot city. Right. Yeah. The pastor was a black man, mm -hmm. yes. and mostly blacks to start with, but soon Mexicans and Russians and Chinese and Japanese. And just like today. Just yes. like today. Yes. From all over the world came, and there was no distinction on race, was no, there? No, no, sure. nobody. Oh, it, one thing that was so nice, nobody ever said, well, you're black or you're white, but we were just children of God, rejoicing and praising God for all of his love and all of his mercy and his kindness for his healing. And that was what brought the people. What did they teach here uh, as, a, the, as a doctrine? Well, they taught that you must first be converted and then you must be sanctified and God would fill you on a sanctified life with his precious Holy Spirit. And you would speak with tongues speak as, as, tongue the evidence. as the evidence, yes. And then other gifts would come like prophecy? Prophecy, healing, and other all the gifts in the Bible. It has Interpretation of tongues, and all, every, every, every gift that's uh, listed in the scripture was practiced right in Azusa Mission. Did it attract a lot of people? Oh my, yes. We never heard the expression, we're gonna have a white preacher preach for us today. It was Brother So-and-so, Brother Simon was going to preach today. And the people would begin in their heart to pray, Lord, give power to your word. I'm interested in the singing. What, what kind of singing did they do? Oh, they did all kinds of good singing. No music. There were no pianos at first. But they sang, the comforters come, oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found. And all songs like that, blessed assurance, deeper yet I pray, and just good old hymns. That's the kind of music we hear. One happy, thing they happy, like, happy one music. One thing they like so much is where Jesus yeah. is, tis heavenly. Heaven yes. Wasn't Jesus the center of this the revival? The center, yes. Oh, how I love Jesus was one of the main what about but these crutches around on the walls? They were for people that came and was healed. And many times people were healed just by being prayed for, not laying on hands all the time. But sometimes uh, Reverend Seymour would just reach and say, the Lord wants to heal somebody. Whoever is here needs to be healed. And people were healed just like that because of the power of God. Did you have an upper room yes. in the building? We had an upper room. And it was... Uh, on this side of the building, and uh, that's where people would go and tarry. On the other side was sleeping quarters where Reverend Seymour used to sleep and have his uh, little uh, apartment there. But that upper room, I don't think it ever was empty because it went day and night. Somebody was there to pray for somebody all could the you, time. Could you tell us about Elder Seymour, the pastor of this mission? Uh, what, he was a black man, Yes. about 30 some years old from Texas, uh -huh. and he came out here, and uh, the Lord used this man to bring on this great revival. What did he look like, and what did he preach like? Well, he didn't preach like the ministers preach today. He preached more just the good word from the power of God came upon him, and he brought the power of God, and uh, the power of God came upon him, and he preached under the anointing of the power of God. And that was so wonderful. We would like to know, Reverend Catlett, the typical type of service that you had here. What, how would they open the service and what would happen? Well, we opened with prayer and, and, and uh, they would, we had no length specified time, I mean length of prayer. So whenever the spirit of the Lord would lift from prayer, would get up. Sometimes it'd be half an hour and sometimes longer. And it wasn't uh, the preacher prayed his little short prayer it was the people all got together and prayed aloud Amen. 
And not like we are now, said that God can't understand all that conglomeration. And I always tell the folks that I'm not the only one in one a city praying. God hears everybody at the same well, time. Well, did they have Bible reading there too? Oh, we had scripture lessons and... and uh, Everybody brought their Bible? Everybody. You knew a Pentecostal person regardless of where you saw them, whether they was going to work or going to a picnic, they always had a Bible. Amen. And they didn't put it in the purse or in the briefcase. They had it out so it could be seen. Now, what about this singing now? <laughs> oh, the singing was always so grand. But one little song is just, well, it's so wonderful for me. It's uh, Never Will I Forget the Day. It was in a gospel hall. Is this the one there, you wrote? There, yes. You wrote, you wrote so? that? That is Wait, the one. Wait, why don't you sing it for us? Could you Let's two see. sing it? I believe both of you can. <laughs> Start it, Lawrence. No, you... <laughs> Never will I, I forget, forget the day it was in the gospel hall. There in deep contrition I on the Lord did call. He did not let me call in vain, but he washed my sins away. And from that hour he gave me power, and I know that he dwells within. Glory to God, for he dwells within my soul. Praise his dear name, he's made me fully whole. Glory to God, from his side I'll ne'er depart. For Jesus, my Savior, is the joy of my heart. Hey, I feel that. You was raising a hand behind my back. Was she really? Oh, that's yes. powerful. Well, well, my God. Were Amen. these people happy when oh, they were? Oh, my. yes. Would they right. shout and Y'all raise shout. their hands and praise, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Yes, seems, praise and It say. seems as though times oh, in my yes, young yes. days it would come in and look like you could just feel the power of God in the atmosphere. Oh, yes. And yes. tears would run down and all drop off my chin and everything. But the, the power of God was just here in mighty power. People... Young children, girls, and boy, girls mostly would get up and sing under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and grown men would cry like babies under conviction. Yes. What about this water baptismal service? Did well, you baptize? Oh, yes, we were baptized. We went down to the Pacific Ocean, down in Terminal Island, and there always were a couple hundred people that were baptized. And I was baptized. They had to carry me out, but I was baptized there in the Pacific Ocean by... Oh, it was wonderful. Seventy years ago? Seventy years ago. That sounds like the Jesus revival uh, yes, now, uh, doesn't yes, it? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, what, what about uh, this, this great uh, movement that was going on? And, and I just felt uh, that... Why did it all break up? Why the divisions? Was it over doctrine? Over doctrine. Because men got proud and felt that they could do things instead of the Holy Spirit doing things. And any time man gets so proud, like they did at that particular time, it just breaks up something. But thank God it doesn't break up the love of God. Aren't you glad Amen. of that? Was there love in this group? Oh, yes, oh, my, yes. Just beautiful terrible. love. All different nationalities. And all different nationalities. You never knew what you were, whether you were black, white, green, or grizzly. Now, Dr. You Sign, you were asking a question while ago about the emotionalism. You remember how they yes. control their meetings? Um, Elder Seymour had a way of... Uh, knowing when something was not of the Lord and controlling that. What did you say oh, happened when yes. he was upstairs? He would stomp his feet and just stomp his feet. And they knew somebody would get it and say, stand up and say, the spirit isn't right in this place. And if they couldn't stop it, pretty soon Elder Simo would come down and he would pray. He would just pray until the spirit of God just calmed everything down so beautiful that it was just wonderful how he calmed What about these uh, evil spirits? And, well, uh, the evil spirits would come. They would come. But God had a way that through these ministers and Reverend Seymour, they pled the blood of Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus that calmed these spirits and put them out of the way. Hey, didn't they sing a lot yeah. of songs Saul, about the blood? Oh, yeah, the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Under the blood, the precious blood, under the cleansing. My mother, by the way, she used to sing under the blood so much, we had an old parrot. That he sang under the blood. Really? Our old a parrot, parrot, yes, a parrot. <laughs> he sang under the blood, oh. the precious blood. Hey, yes. What about these missionaries? Did they go all over the world? They did. Yeah. They went all over the world. And they went because they were called, and people believed that they were called. Mm -hmm. And they went and they came back and they brought wonderful reports of how God saved 
the heathen people and how they were brought into the kingdom of God. Um, how did they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Would they lay hands on them or would they receive the baptism and speak with tongues back in the audience? Or did they have a tarrying room or what? Well, they had a room upstairs they called the upper room where you went to tarry for the Holy Spirit. But we could not control the Spirit of God. Sometimes a person would receive the Holy Ghost right in an audience without even an altar call. They just stand right up and begin speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utter. And sometimes that happened in conversion. A person would get under conviction and submit themselves to the Lord. I maintain you don't have to come to a specific place called an altar. You give up in your heart and the Lord will save you then, there, wherever you are. Uh, Doctor, I, I was amazed at uh, the same language uh, problem was broken down and people were converted because they heard their language here at this spot. Yes. Did you actually hear people speaking in Chinese, Chinese or Japanese that they Russian, didn't learn? Uh, Russian. Russian? They sp yeah. Black people, red people, they spoke languages, not gibbering but real languages and Japanese are those that people would come in and hear them speak in their language and they would be under conviction. And they insisted that it be a language that would flow and That's sound right. like a language. That's right. Now and the person didn't know this language. No, 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 no. They One hadn't learned thing, it. Uh, brethren, we have uh, missed uh, in the beginning particularly, a lot of these people came off the streets from gambling houses and hard places of ho uh, harlots and, look, look. and they didn't know about now, church work. They came from many distances, didn't yes. they? There's a oh, train everywhere. station over there and uh, over here is the bus station. Yes. And how far would you say people traveled? Oh, blocks and blocks and sometimes they would come all the way from Pasadena and all these little outlying cities. Where did you come from? Uh, I came from Watts. We lived in Watts, and we came, and we, many a time, we walked, as Lord says, we walked halfway up here in order to get To get here, to what? To Z get to Azusa Street. Sunday school. Sunday school. Oh, that's good. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Sunday you, school was wonderful. You mean the children loved? Uh, Sunday school, the children loved because the teachers loved it. I'm and interested in the children in this revival. What happened to them? They were saved. Well, did they? Did they they were saved, really saved. Yeah, yeah they got well, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and they sat down in church and just enjoyed the service like any of the older. Who did they sit with? They sat with their parents, and sometimes we all sat together, but we didn't talk. Did any of them prophesy? Yes, they prophesied, spoke in tongues, and how did they sound when they prophesied? Just like older people. You Good. mean it was a mature word? Uh, yes, real words. They prophesied, and God knew. And we knew that God was using them. Did you know that people came from all over the country, like uh, uh, Elder Mason from Memphis, who founded the Church of God in Christ? Did you see him? Oh, yes, I should say so. I saw Elder Mason before he came here. Is that right? That's right. And did you know that people like a white man, G.B. Cashwell from North Carolina, came? Came. And he went back in the... Spirit. The whole southeast turned Pentecost yes. the holiness movement. Yes. And people from Europe and Canada came. And uh, this mission right here on this spot became the place where the Lord began to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And you saw that yes. yourself. Yes. Dr. Wigglesworth from England came and many, many others came. And from all over the world they've come. And this is the place where it all began. But it's not going to end here. It's going to end in heaven. In our research, we were able to find only one living person who was at the Azusa Awakening. He was the tender age of 12 when attending the meetings, but he still vividly recalls those thrilling times. Here we are in Acadia, California. It's 1991, 20 years after we made the film on the other two people that you met on Azusa Street. They are now in heaven. They're not with us anymore. The only people that I know of that's still alive from that wonderful revival are these that are sitting here with me. We've done everything that we can to find Tracel's people. Uh, this is Mr. Fred Gressinger, and uh, uh, I see I have a plaque here. It says on his 90th birthday. Are you really 90? Last March. Last March. And you still got original hair, original teeth, uh, you're, you're no no hearing aids. You're 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 pretty original. That's wonderful. You were a commissioner of the state of California, real estate commissioner. That's correct. How long? It was about three years back in 1957 through 59. Well, I'm amazed at God's gift to you. And who are these beautiful ladies sitting here? Ha uh ha! -huh. This special Esther Toon, sister Esther, and she says she's 83. 
and Marie Jacobs, and she is 85. And they're very choice, though. I, I have a, 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 a need for both of them. Yeah, why are they special? Why are they special? Yeah. Because the name was Greasinger at one time. Oh, your sisters. <laughs> now, uh, were they in the revival in Azusa Street? No, not really. Uh, Azusa Street was uh, the best I know as far as Azusa Street is concerned. My brother and I have decided it was 1908. That's when we were first uh, apprised of it, and my father, of course, was the one that uh, took us there. And uh, so in 1908, I was then uh, seven years old, and uh, Esther, Esther was a... I was born in 1908. Well, you were born in... I was two years old. And you were two years old. So that's about the way it was, and then there was one other, Martha, who had passed along, oh, some years ago. But your sister here was healed in that revival. No, this, the, the healing was in 1913. And 13. I'll, yeah, 1913. Th then she was uh, seven years old, mm -hmm. and uh, also Esther's uh, occasion when she was so badly scalded uh, in boiling water, and uh, that was a serious thing, and she was just a, a, a child. 1909 that was. I was 18 months old. 18 months old, yeah. And that was when we were still living in tents down in the Arroyo Seco. What do you mean, tents? Was After that those camp meeting? Yes, kids? that was a leftover from the camp meeting in 1913. Now, if you want to back up to 1908, there, there was very little we can add to it except we were there. Well, uh, you, my father, I'd, I'd tell you how we got there and what yeah, I want to know that story. All right, my father was a uh, was a choir leader at the German Baptist Church. Baptist. Yeah, and uh, at uh, 15th and Myrtle Streets in uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Now that was walking distance or running distance or whichever and uh, when he first heard of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit down at Azusa Street it immediately attracted him well uh, he didn't know just exactly what it was all about until after the first time or two he went down there and he, he told mother he says we're going to have to get down there this is something the Lord is really doing something down there and so he would lead his choir and uh, go out the back door and run down to Azusa Street. That's how anxious he was to get it down there and so on. Now, he liked the music, didn't he, huh? being a choir man? Oh, well, I should think so. Yeah. <laughs> I should think they so. They were singing people, weren't they? That was one of the choicest things I know about. Uh, as a matter of fact, then I'll uh, divert just a little bit in saying it that way. Uh, in 1913, uh, the, the tents were up, and there was a, a large tent for the normal services, and there was one uh, smaller one that, uh, they call it young people. I didn't know whether they're kids or, or, or young married or who they were. They were having a real good time. They were singing, and they were praising the Lord and testifying, and I wandered into this tent meeting. Well, I sat down in the front seat, and the first thing I knew, I stood up there. I said, I'm glad I'm saved, and I'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. God took me right out of this world. I went totally unconscious. Nobody touched me. No one prayed for me. No one said one word to me. And then when I came to, my hands were up, and I was talking in tongues, and I never stopped for all night. All night? That's right. What was the first impression? What did you have happen? I was a child, 12 years old. Yeah, I know, but uh, did you have a Well, bonus? I had seen people speaking in tongues, of course, at, at Azusa Street. I had seen them at, uh, at uh, Brother uh, down there on, uh, on Spring Street, uh, where, where a lot of the folks went uh, out of uh, Azusa Street. Uh, let's see, what was his name? Fisher. Uh -huh. oh, yes. Elmer Fisher. Oh, yeah. oh, we heard Elmer him. Fisher. Oh, my. they had wonderful meetings in there, and so I had been uh, I had been alerted and had been apprised of what was going on. Even the one thing I remember to this day, they had a placard on the way up the stairs that said, "Jesus is coming soon." I asked the folks. I said, "When's that going to be?" They believed that, didn't they? Oh, <laughs> and we've believed it ever since too. Yeah. Yes, and so. Uh, that power we we were experienced very very uh, greatly, 
the folks used to, by that time we had seven children in the family and we'd all go down there and most of them slept on the floor or somewhere and uh, so the one of the bases uh, of the Holy Spirit operations was in that place there on uh, on uh, Spring Street now that's uh, uh, that brings us to that uh, one uh, story that I had and I have a cop uh, a copy for you if you wish it yes, I would. Uh, or at least we can get copy well, we'll made show that to them. and and that is my my mother now my mother wasn't an outgoing person uh -huh. she had all these children to take care of and and she did her work uh, admirably uh, but in this one time at the at that particular service, she got up and began speaking in tongues. Now that was unlike mother. Yeah. And so she in kept a public meeting. in a public meeting, sure. And I don't remember now whether it was a Sunday morning or what. That I, it's beside the point anyway. So they, uh, uh, she sat down, and that was that. At the close of the service, there was a man came up and talked to Brother George B. Studd, who came from Penile Mission, the yes. uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance. Yes. And, uh, of course, he and my father uh, uh, hit it off just beautifully. By that time, my dad had gotten the baptism, even though mother beat him to it, as it were. That's a poor way of saying it. Uh, and Brother Studd, at the same time, had difficulty getting through to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, when this man spoke to D Brother Studd, he said, well, that language, uh, uh, she had learned that somewhere. That's beautiful. And he said, no, that's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And he said, well, I don't, I don't know anything about that. So that ended it for that night. But some nights later, Mother got up and spoke in tongues again. Again, completely out of context, you might say. And... Uh, here, this man was sitting back there, and he just shook his head. I mean, I don't know the, the, all the little details, but that's the way it sounded. And, uh, and when he got through, he said, I want to know something about this, because that woman just told me where I was going to go if I didn't repent. Spoke a language that he understood. And comes out of the middle of Africa. Really? And she, of course, knew nothing and never did after that know anything. He went up and got, got beautifully saved as a result of it, because that was the impossible. As far as he was concerned, that, that was it. So that in the 1910, there was a lot of movement going on as a carryover, I thought, uh, from uh, Azusa Street. And uh, whether or not there was, uh, there were some uh, blacks, not as many as the other, because whether or not uh, uh, the doctrinal uh, issues had separated some of them, uh, there were uh, uh, saved, sanctified, and baptized. Uh, and uh, of course, it didn't take too long before the people took sides, I, I have to presume. But anyway, at the. Uh, Don't uh, you think that's sad? I think it's sad today, I tell you frankly. Uh, it, it gets me down, and I've been in this ministry now for 77 years. And I still say, the Lord's going to have to do something for all of us. Got it. We, on need, a, that we need a new baptism of love. On that you? basis, yes, sir. Now, you, uh, you you heard your dad and your mom talk about some of those days, though, didn't you? Oh, well, we were we were in it. You were in it. I know you were in it, but you heard them talk about oh, it, Oh, indeed. And, and you know any other stories or any case histories that you can think of, of things that happened that might be significant? Well... And not, uh, not, not uh, really, except uh, one occasion where there was a man come in demon possessed. Yeah, let's hear that. And that was a very serious thing. Uh, how in the world I ever got mixed into it, I have no idea. Here I am, still a kid. And uh, this person was completely frothing and, and, and screaming, and, uh, and uh, three or four people were trying to hold him down, couldn't. And I was one of couldn't the... Couldn't control it. Couldn't control it. And you were helping hold him I up. was holding... I was down there with it, too. Keep pointing that thing towards <laughs> you there, all right? All right. Uh, now, the... Uh, but did he get delivered? He got delivered. He certainly did. He, yeah. he went out just like someone shot him. 
I mean, he, he just flattened right out after he had taken several people on his shoulders and walked from a, from a laying position I want you right to describe, straight up. I want you to describe the Azusa Street Mission, what it looked like. The Azusa Street Mission was like a big barn. Was it? <laughs> yes, it was. Did it smell like a barn? Well, I, had, I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> yeah, what, did, what did Elder Seymour, Bishop Seymour, look like? Was he a big man? I think just normal size. I haven't, I haven't uh -huh. any opinions on that or, or uh -huh. any memories that would. Uh, what do you reflect. remember about his spirit? Was he a gentle man? Yes, he was. Very Pers gentle, huh? Supposedly, very much so. As a matter of fact, I had found out later uh, that uh, most of the time it wasn't a question of who was doing the preaching; it was who was there. Yeah. Yeah, it, the preaching didn't do the didn't do the trick at all. As if that, that's using language out there. No, no. Uh, it, it was a question of, of coming in there and worshiping, and the people would, that, that were really got out after God got down and was filled with the Holy Spirit. Did they praise a lot? Oh, indeed they did. That was, that was one of the, uh, the things that we noticed. My brother Bill and I have uh, repeated this time and again. We could look in the windows that were opened uh, from the sides and so on, and it was all hard hard benches and so on. Hard, huh? Yes, it was. No no nice pews, huh? <laughs> Never heard of it. Uh, they have, did, in Azusa Street, did they have a piano in there? You remember a piano? I can't tell you whether I... Well, I important I, then, was never, it? It, it never occurred to me. Uh-huh. Did, uh, uh, did, you, did you have Sunday school? I don't believe there was ever Sunday school. I think it just started with the service starting in and, and started singing. How long the service? Oh, well, way, way, way after noon. It, it was about two or three hours services. Two or three hours. Yeah, that, now I'm, I'm guessing at this point, and that's about the way it uh -huh. looked like. Now, when you went to those camp meetings, you go to church all night, too? Uh, you... Well, you see, uh, the next big move was the 1913 camp meeting. Oh, and that was it, huh? That was it, and uh, I mean, that was something. And of course, in 1913, they had no automobiles. They, the streetcar was about three quarters of a mile up there in the hill, called Pastina Avenue, or now North Figueroa, and they would they would load those streetcars and come out and walk down to the canyon there at the bottom of the hill, and uh, a lot of them took residence right there on the ground, got uh, canvas tents. And would go in there. You could go any time, day or night. There'd be someone be praying, and there was someone be singing, and so on and so on. And that's why, when uh, when Dad really felt the the urge to get into the Pentecost, and I couldn't tell you the time or date or anything when he left the Baptist Church, but from that time on in '13, he, uh, he was always at uh, in in the Pentecostal. Um, uh, movement, and so uh, uh, he decided. And of course, we were we were poor. There was no doubt about it. Uh, Dad was a bookbinder, and he did the best he could. And uh, in those days, uh, it was hard, uh, very very difficult. And so uh, we we got uh, two tents. We seven children slept in one. In, in fact, all of us did. And uh, and the, the stove was a was a pot belly uh, wood uh, burning stove. That's the way we cooked. Mother did. And uh, we had one uh, galvanized tub. I don't know what what kind of arrangement we had. Who had the bath this week or next? It was beside <laughs> the point. But uh, the, and that was the second uh, uh, tent that where, where they could sit around or or eating and so on. So that uh, when uh, when the camp meeting closed sometime in June, then we had no place to go. Yeah. So we stayed right there. Uh, the uh, uh, the neighbors graciously let us turn the faucets on for water, and we dug a hole and dug our own well there for a while. And I don't think the the. The health department allowed us to do that, but we did it anyway. And uh, we were just about, or oh, a short distance from the elementary school, so that some of us at, uh, at that time were just about going to school. And uh, and we were there. Uh, that was well. I, I don't know. That must have been the first day of September by that time, 
but we were there all that time in these tents. And uh, during that time is when Marie had uh, 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 an attack of polio. And uh, the, the best I know, and from the information that I've been able to gather all the way through from everybody, including Bill and the, and the girls and myself and two, uh, the, the folks just simply, they just couldn't take it. This idea, her, her left limb was, no. well, your le one leg was bad. Was it? Mama had a vision that they better get me out of bed and walking. So Dad had come home from work and walked me up the hill and down the hill. Yeah, that, that. The health department was going to take me to the hospital, but they had no room. And... Uh, we tested the water, everything was fine, everything was clean, and uh, this went on for several weeks. And finally, there was room at the hospital for me, and the folks took me down. The doctor looked at me and says, there's nothing wrong with that girl. Healed. Healed. Sent me home. Who prayed for you? Mama and Dad. <laughs> they took her up and down the roadway, and they just challenged the devil. Yeah. I don't even like to give them that much credit, but they challenged the devil to take his blamed hands right off of her and now. Listen, let me ask you, did you go to any of the baptismal services at the ocean? Not at the ocean, no. Uh -huh. uh, no, I heard of them, yes. You did, huh? I did. But we, they, what are the things you heard about the revival of Azusa that was most outstanding to you? I, I think... Uh, Brother, it, it, it was really a little after Azusa that uh, most, uh, I, th I think that was the, tr the testing ground yeah. as such. And I think if I would say that, then I think that's where it was. Because churches from everywhere sent uh, emissaries over there to, to criticize it or to try to stop it or do anything they could. But uh, God went through with it. And uh, then from there, they started moving in different directions. There was one down south Los Angeles. Then, uh, then there was uh, uh, down in east Los Angeles. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, in 1910, up there in the uh, Upper Room Mission. That's yeah, what everybody called. remembers Upper Room. That's, that's what the name it went, went by, Upper Room Mission with uh, Brother uh, Fisher. And uh, incidentally, uh, his daughter, uh, Ruth Fisher, uh, later, and quite a bit later, married Wesley Steelberg. Well, I knew her very well. Did you? Oh, sure. I knew her well. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Everybody knew her. And that Wes Steelberg Jr. was a very close friend of mine. Oh, well, down here at Long Beach? Yes, yes. Was that so? Yes. There's no question this is one of the greatest revivals of our century. And you've had an opportunity to be in it, brother. Gretzinger? Uh, Greasinger. Greasinger. Well, I got it right that time. That's what I said. <laughs> uh, you, you know, the thing that thrills me is that it's just as fresh today as it was when it happened to you. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Amen. Your name's Brother Meshagan. We're here in a morning worship at Melody Land. Yes. And what do you know about the Holy Ghost? Well, the Holy Ghost is real. The power of the Holy Ghost is great. I saw in a book the other day that your family was in the Azusa Street Revival, Meshagan. Yes, that was my grandfather and my father that was there, right after they got here from the old country. What old country? Armenia, of course. And the Holy Spirit had fallen, fallen on them in the old country. Now, Shakarians were in that group. Yes, they were there also, yes. They, now, weren't we there all some came prophecies? Through. Yes. Well, my grandfather prophesied. There was also a young man that prophesied, but my grandfather also prophesied that we must leave the country and come here because of the persecution. And of course, they did do that. They came here in, I think, 1906, 1905, 1906, somewhere in that area. My father then was about 14, 15 years old. So all of the people could have been wiped out had they not done what God told them. They would have been, their town, the, the town of Karhala, Armenia, 
was completely wiped out. Everyone that remained was killed. So this was the Holy Spirit working in prophecy, telling them what was coming upon the world. Oh, yes. Yes, the Holy Spirit led them out of that place to a, a better country. They came to Canada first. Really? Yes. And then from Canada, they came down into here. And uh, this is where they met people that was of the same faith that they were. You mean the same things were happening down here that were happening over yes, in um, the old country? When they, when they came here, they were looking for work, of course. You uh, heard the term starving Armenians. Well, they were starving when they came here, believe me. And these men actually went out with their bare hands and created empires by their bare hands. But they were out looking for work, and they happened to pass a place called Azusa, Azusa Street. Street. And they heard some noise in there, and they knocked on the door. And uh, in their broken English, which was only a couple words, uh, tried to make themselves known if they could come in. They said, sure, come on in. And that was the Azusa Street outpouring of God's Spirit in, in uh, Los Angeles. Grandpa and uh, my father and Isaac also, Demas' uh, uh, dad, uh, said, this is the same thing that's happened to us. I believe Demas' dad was filled with the Holy Ghost in Azusa Street. Now, I want to tell you, folks, that whenever God does something, he does it all over the world. God doesn't do anything in secret. It, that's how you know whether this is of God or not. He doesn't give just a blessing to one person, but he begins to anoint different places. Yeah. yeah. But, Pastor, you know, uh, like I told you before, I really like to give some honor to Sister Cotton. Who's Sister Cotton? Well, when Brother Seymour came from Texas, he came to a church. I That's the one-eyed... Yes, the one-eyed black, black preacher. preacher. Nazarene preacher. And he came here to minister to the black people. And it was the black people that was open-hearted and allowed the Holy Ghost to begin to work in their hearts. Come heart, on, let's thank God for life. our black brothers and sisters. Amen. But the church that he came into after his first sermon, now Brother Seymour had not as yet received the Holy Ghost. But the church that he came to, he read in Acts where the Holy Ghost was for us today with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And he says, I think we ought to delve deeper into this. And so the next night when they came back to church, the church door was closed and there was a note pinned on the door that, that the revival is terminated, that we don't need you here anymore because they did not believe in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Brother Seymour and about 15 people was being turned away when Sister Cotton, another precious black sister, said, come to my house. I'll open my house. Reminds me of Paul and uh, was Lydia. That's it. That went over and come on to my house. You know, and it almost sounds Armenian. Come on to my house. What, what, what street was that now that Sister Cotton's house was? Bonnie Bray. Bonnie Bray. Yeah, Bonnie. Thank you, because I didn't remember uh -huh. that. One. We've been there, and yeah. you'll see that. Yeah, Bonnie Bray, right. Now... Uh, can you remember any of the things in particular that your father or grandfather told you about in that re uh, revival? What in, you, know, you know, one of the things that really stands out to me, uh, of course, uh, it may not to you, but the fire department was called out because they said there was fire burning in that place and they could see flames of fire shooting up out of the place. And they came down and searched and there was no fire except for the Holy Ghost fire. That's what they saw. The people saw it. Businessmen came from all around, and they were drawn. Nobody told them about the place being there, but both whites and blacks got together and received the power of the Holy Ghost, and that was the beginning of Pentecost for us. Let me tell you, I was in St. Louis, Missouri at a new church, and the night before I arrived, the whole neighborhood said they saw a fire in this church up on a hill. And they called fire departments. There were five calls. And the fire engines roared up there. And they said, where's the fire? And there was no physical fire. It was the fire of God that was seen by the whole neighborhood. Amen. Same thing happened on the day there at Azusa, Azusa. At Azusa. And on the day of Pentecost. But the same outpouring broke out in Texas, broke out in South Carolina, South or North Carolina. 
the same thing began to break out. It went worldwide and, oh, hallelujah. Well, I'm glad you got in it. Your deacon, my deacon, rather, your son, yes. part of this church, and you're part of this church, and that revival is not going to stop till Jesus comes again. Amen. Praise the Lord.